Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. And I don't know about you, Hannah, but I am ready for the winter holidays to start. Like, now. Like, mm-hmm. yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like, immediately. Mm-hmm. Hard agree. I'm usually a no-holiday-decorations-before-December-1st kind of person, but I think we all need... Like an extra infusion of lights and maybe an above average intake of holiday beverages. Oh, yes. Come to think of it, I actually would really like to hear all about your holiday beverage menu (laughs) in the sorting chat. Ooh, what a great idea. Okay, so what I really like about holiday beverages is that they can be both alcoholic or non-alcoholic, and they Mm -hmm. are still a delightful festive treat. I also really like how many excellent holiday beverages can hold their own with or without alcohol. I think that's a real value of the beverage menu of this season. As much as I might personally prefer to put alcohol (laughs) in all of them, I like that there are inclusive (laughs) beverage options. Yes, absolutely. I like how once the snow hits the ground and stays there, it is a totally reasonable thing for your coffee to have some kind of Irish cream type beverage added to it, whether it's vegan or dairy, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. But there are all kinds of specific holiday related flavors that you can just acquire to add to something as basic as your morning coffee. But I also, I really like that this is a season of hot cocktails. Mm -hmm. Like I am into a sort of like, you know, of a (laughs) 7 p.m. when it's already been dark for three hours. You know, (laughs) I I like a toasty warm beverage. But when I think about holiday beverages, what I always think about is my Uncle Rob's family's holiday beverage policy. Their holiday policy is that you must have three drinks on the go at any given time. (laughs) So like on a Christmas day, you'll have, you know, a coffee with Bailey's, a mimosa and a Caesar. You just have all three. You've just got them all going. Just whatever you particularly want to take a sip of in that moment. And there is something for me so hilariously luxurious about multiple simultaneous <laughs> beverages. I mean, and this applies <laughs> in a non-alcoholic context, which is like, oh, it's a festive day. I'm going to have a coffee and an orange juice. And also, I don't know what a third drink is. A smoothie. And also a smoothie. There's just something to me that feels so fancy about more than one drink at the same time. <laughs> We can't start celebrating quite yet because it's time for revision, where we look back at what we've already covered and move forward to some new questions we want to ask. Okay, quick summary of some points from the last episode. We talked about feminism and feminist theory. Quick refresher, feminism, it's a movement that seeks the social, political, and economic equality for all persons, regardless of sex or gender. Feminism is necessarily intersectional, and by that we mean that we can't talk about gender without taking into account the other social hierarchies that organize power in our society, like race, class, ability, sexuality, age. There are tons more. We talked about the ways that feminism informs our reading of texts at both micro levels and macro levels. Yeah, and we illustrated that by looking at some really small scenes in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets in order to get a sense of how it operates, you know, at the micro level. Mm hmm. Exactly. And we talked about how feminist theory being huge, a huge theory, encompasses tons of different positions and indeed competing perspectives. And that a number of theories have branched out of and in response to feminist theory because there are some issues that feminist theory by itself just doesn't adequately explain. 
I mean, that is a great segue into today's topic because queer theory is one of those theories that has branched out of feminist theory (laughs) because, you know, feminist theory as originally articulated didn't necessarily have a sort of adequate way of theorizing the way that sexuality and gender relate to each other. So when we start looking at some of the examples that we brought up last episode, we can already see how feminist theory sort of starts to get us there, but maybe we need some more explicitly queer theory to really think about how gender and sexuality are related, mm-hmm. perhaps. Yeah. So you suggested, Hannah, in our notes that we should talk about Lockhart, and I think that Lockhart is a rock-solid example because feminist theory gives us the tools to recognize that this man's we'll call it femininity, marks him as bad, but we need queer theory to explain how and why. Yeah, absolutely. So we can recognize misogyny at work in the way that a bad male villain is coded as feminine, right? That's sort of one level of analysis is So, you know, we encounter Lockhart and we know right away not to trust him because he is excessively interested in his appearance. And really, like, the more we get of him, the more it's like he has his hair in rollers and uses Mm -hmm. hair nets. He dresses in, quote unquote, lurid pink robes. Mm -hmm. You know, he has all of these descriptors that mark him as like not performing his masculinity in a socially sanctioned way. So there's one level we can say like men being feminine is a sign that they are dangerous. But that doesn't get us into the sort of complex way that gender is actually getting represented in the Mm -hmm. character of Lockhart. And really the whole idea of what it means to like code somebody as queer in the first place. Really the whole idea Mm -hmm. of what like queer means Mm -hmm. there's a lot more going on here that we need to understand beyond just Lockhart wears pink pink is a girl color Mm -hmm. I hope everybody can really hear me putting all of these things in like great big scare quotes (laughs) because there's no (laughs) such thing as a girl color but we can also recognize the ways that these kinds of tropes are getting enacted in a text and You know, to go back to our whole discussion about tropes and ideology, when we talked about the first book, you know, tropes are a clue for us about the kinds of ideologies that are at work in a text Mm -hmm. and the way that the sort of feminization is getting enacted here is like a clue to us about the text's sort of gender ideologies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We might think about how working in conjunction with Lockhart's coding is the book's heavy-handed heteronormativity. Ooh. What a big word. (laughs) So in the last episode, we talked about how Hermione's crush on Lockhart is used to make her look silly. But in this episode, I think we can really think about how we as readers are expected to believe that every witch in the UK, if not beyond, is expected to be attracted, sexually attracted, to one single wizard type, except for the Hogwarts faculty, which is like maybe a whole other conversation about like why that might be. But in any case, the reader is expected to take heteronormativity for granted, and this is reinforced by showing us that any deviation from heteronormativity, for example, Lockhart's hair in rollers, Mm -hmm. (laughs) his love of himself, his love of looking at himself, is at best silly, but at worst, it's dangerous Mm. and bad. I mean... Evil. (laughs) Villainous. It is shown as dangerous. And there Mm -hmm. is a reason why heteronormativity is so closely aligned with being safe and normal and trustworthy. And it's a little bit more complicated than just homophobia, 
though it mm-hmm. definitely is homophobia. But there's something a little bit more complicated going on there when we think about how heteronormativity structures a book like this. But I think if we're going to talk about that, we should probably define heteronormativity. Yes. Okay. That's a very good idea. Should we just take a little a little jaunt into some queer theory? Let's do it. Let's go. Cool. Take me on a journey, Hannah. (laughs) I know it's hard to believe, but the semester isn't even over yet. In fact, we are late for transfiguration class. (laughs) The segment where we unpack a new set of theoretical tools. So queer theory. Much like our discussion of feminist theory, this is going to be like a one-on-one introduction. We are going to come back to queer theory later in this podcast. (laughs) We are going to delve down into different topics, into different theorists, but here's our sort of intro. Mm -hmm. So queer theory is quite a new form of theory. In fact, it emerged in the 1990s, which if you're young, sounds like a long time ago, but I assure you was (laughs) extremely recent. (laughs) And it emerged primarily out of feminist theory, but also out of gay studies and lesbian studies, which were sort of new scholarly fields. The term was coined by Teresa de Loretis, iconic early queer theorist. From the beginning, it was interested in challenging heteronormativity. So there's that word again. We're going to come back to that. And nuancing our understanding of sexuality by thinking about how it intersects with both race and gender. That's there in the article that queer theory was coined in. So while this hasn't always been the case in practice, queer studies and queer theory is intersectional in its early formations because queerness is intersectional. We can't even start to articulate a definition of what it means to be queer without thinking about the many different aspects of our identities that intersect with sexuality. Okay. So the idea that queerness is inherently intersectional then suggests that heterosexuality, or rather the idea of heterosexuality as natural, also operates as a system of power. So can you talk a little bit about how that works? Yes, absolutely. That is spot on. So probably the foundational concept of queer theory is heteronormativity. That is to unpack that like hetero as in heterosexuality and normativity as in the sort of structural centering of heterosexuality as a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. So in their field defining article, Sex in Public, Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner describe heteronormativity as, quote, the institutions, structures of understanding, and practical orientations that make heterosexuality seem not only coherent, that is, organized as a sexuality, but also privileged, end quote. So one of their points, really, is that heteronormativity is not just about heterosexual privilege. It's about a whole power system that Mm. structures heterosexuality as a norm. So we might look not only to default assumptions of heterosexuality, right? Looking at somebody and just assuming as a default that they're straight Mm -hmm. and the corresponding erasure of queer relationships. So the way that, you know, if you are somebody in a queer relationship, you might just have people erase or not see your relationship because of the way that people are often sort of looking for heterosexuality. Right, 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 right. So that's, you know, one piece of it. Mm -hmm. But we also need to look at the way institutions are organized around presumed heterosexuality. So that makes queer relationships institutionally illegible in ways that actively endanger queer people. So think about, you know, if you live in a place where gay marriage is not legal, then you might not be able to Mm -hmm. visit your partner in the hospital you might not be able to have legal guardianship of your shared children. Heteronormativity is baked into our legal, social, and institutional structures. So a critique of heterosexuality as, and here is, this is Berlant and Warner's words again, as invisible, tacit, society-found rightness, 
that's been one of the major projects of queer theory. Certainly not the only one, but understanding the way that heterosexuality is what makes you legible as a subject in the eyes of the state is a Mm -hmm. major project of queer theory. Right. So you're not a person if you're not straight and your relationship isn't a relationship unless it is legible as heterosexual in the eyes of the state. And so that's why we would hear things about like, oh, I have this relative and this is their roommate. And it's like, oh, so-and-so has been your relative's roommate for 25 years. That seems like an awfully long time to be roommates. (laughs) A hundred percent. A hundred percent. There is a wonderful Netflix documentary called A Secret Love, which is about these two women, one of whom played in that um, women's baseball league that A League of Their Own (gasps) is based on. And these women have been partners for... 50 years oh my God. and they are in their 80s and they are just coming out to their families. Oh my God. Their families who have just thought that they are gal pals for over five decades. That's amazing. It is so beautiful, but it also takes you back into, you know, a little bit of the history that made them make those choices, including mm-hmm. the like real danger that queer people, you know, have experienced historically and continue to experience in the present, right? So we're not just talking about, like, representational erasure. We're talking about, like, real forms of institutional oppression. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's heteronormativity. That is one big idea in queer theory. All right, Hannah, pop quiz. I want you to name three more projects of queer theory. Go. Great. I'm ready. I'm ready. And you know why I'm ready? Because I have notes. Why? Okay. (laughs) Project the first, your friend and mine, Michel Foucault. We have talked about Foucault before. We will talk about Foucault again. (laughs) And some, one of Foucault's sort of iconic texts is the history of sexuality. Mm -hmm. And in it, Foucault is talking about discourse, which we Mm -hmm. have discussed already, and the relationship between power and knowledge, the way you generate knowledge about people or segments of the population in order to control them. And he is particularly interested in the emergence of our contemporary vocabularies of sexuality, so heterosexual, homosexual, as an example of sort of identities that are formed through discourse. So essentially, you know, his argument, and this is everybody who's read Foucault is going to get mad because this is such a nutshell. But essentially his (laughs) argument is that prior to the invention of stable categories of sexuality, Mm -hmm. the whole idea of sexuality is a thing that needed to be named, stigmatized, and managed didn't really exist. What? I know, right? We can look back to the sort of very comfortable queerness of, say, like ancient Greek philosophers who are like, Mm -hmm. yes, of course, I love boys and then I also love girls. This is just a thing that a human being does. There are many forms of love. And the whole idea of like, that is a homosexual thing to do. Just like, it just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. Foucault is really interested in how modernity is marked in part by this sort of naming and like medicalizing of homosexuality as a way to like introduce heteronormativity, like as as a structural norm. And to have power over people. Because discourse is always connected to power. Because heterosexuality doesn't exist until the invention of homosexuality, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, if we need to organize power around a particular lifestyle, we need to name the lifestyle. And the way that we name the lifestyle is by defining what it is in relation to what it is not. And what it is not is deviant and bad and wrong. Scare quotes again. Scare quotes. Scare quotes. All of the scare quotes. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. Okay. Person the second that we got we to gotta look at is Judith Butler. Oh. Judith Butler's gender trouble was my personal introduction to queer theory and it still holds a very special place in my heart. And this is the book where Butler argues that gender is performative rather than innate. Right. That whole idea, like she's really central to the division between gender and sex 
and the way that we sort of have gotten, I think, generally more comfortable articulating a difference between biological sex, though even that is a category that we must contest. Mm -hmm. That's a minefield. The whole idea that there's like a stable biological sex, but that idea that sort of the biological sex that you are assigned at birth and your gender are not the same thing Mm -hmm. has, you know, as one of its very strong bases, this whole idea of gender as performative, as a sort of series of ongoing performances that are reinforced iteratively from the very first moment when we are born, where we are labeled via the speech act, it's a girl or it's a boy, right? And that, that, that performance then becomes sort of insidiously repeated across our lives, such that they turn into a thing we call gender and treat as though it's stable. Mm-hmm. And the reason why this is like really tied into queer theory is that basically the performance of gender as a binary, as a stable binary, male and female, reinforces the truth, quote unquote, of biological sex which then reinforces heteronormativity as a norm. That if you're like, there are these two binaries, people are men or people are women, and those things have stable identifiers in terms of how we look and how we act, and those stable identifiers are based in biological fact, and all of that is essential and natural and true, And so heteronormativity or heterosexuality is also essential and natural and true. Hmm. Hmm. And yet for something that is essential and natural, there are so many like rules and limits and expectations that you have to like keep performing. If you keep performing the thing that's natural, is it really natural? It's always a dead giveaway that something is an ideological construction when it needs so much fucking work to (laughs) perpetuate it, right? Like you've got to be policing gender at every second. Mm -hmm. And then people are like, gender's natural. And it's like, "Mm, yeah, if it was natural, would it need this much fucking work? If it was natural, would people really like get so upset if you bought the wrong color onesie and brought it to the baby shower? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, right? It needs so much reinforcement all the time because the binary is so artificial. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, part of what Butler talks about is the way that because the gender binary is structural to heteronormativity, performatively poking fun at gender norms is a queer act of resistance. And so Ah. that's where she brings in things like drag Mm -hmm. or like feminine butch dynamics, Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That this is sort of gender play or gender trouble, hence the Mm. name of the book. (laughs) And that troubling gender is a queer thing to do, which is a way of starting to think about how gender and sexuality are interlocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredible. And then the last person I want to point at is Mm -hmm. Eve Kozowski Sedgwick, who is a really contested figure. I haven't had a chance to read this yet, but Grace Lavery, who is a a really incredible trans studies scholar who I really admire, has actually been writing quite a lot against Sedgwick and her sort Mm. of ongoing inheritance in queer theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lavery argues that a lot of the foundational ideas that Sedgwick has introduced are transphobic. And this is not scholarship I have read yet. I really look forward to reading it because I always really, really like Lavery's writing. But I want to, you know, point to the fact that many of these foundational theorists are really contested. But what Sedgwick is doing, her sort of foundational text is called Epistemology of the Closet. And in it, she basically is doing this kind of interrogating of this heterosexuality versus homosexuality binary. And, you know, asking in a similar way to how Foucault was doing it. Like, are these actually stable categories or identities at all? And she particularly looks at sort of variations of sexuality that don't fit neatly into the binary, which has made her really important for people who look at global sexualities and are really interested in like how, you know, you're either straight or you're not straight doesn't really actually work globally. Mm. And she's also really interested in speech acts, particularly the sort of act of coming out and the role that they play in the formation of queerness. So why do we so often think about 
queerness as something that doesn't exist until somebody speaks it into being. Ah. Whereas heterosexuality, always already real. Right, 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 right. Only queer people have to come out. Exactly, exactly. You never have to come out as straight right? because straightness is sort of always already assumed, always already a norm, you know, structures the way we relate to each other, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Whereas queerness always has to be like aimed and performed and enacted. Okay, okay. Good job, Hannah. Thanks. You got full marks. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. You can't give me marks, I'm the teacher. (laughs) Oh, whoops. But I gave you a pop quiz. Okay, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So clearly there are big picture ways to look at queer theory in Harry Potter. So Hannah, where should we start? There's a lot of ways into the conversation about queerness in Harry Potter. I think, you know, for one, we can and must think about heteronormativity and how it shapes the legibility of our protagonists. So particularly Harry and Hermione and Ron as our sort of three central characters. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. You know, this is a coming of age story and coming of age in the story is synonymous with heterosexual desire and ultimately coupling. Mm. So right from the get go, we've got to think about how heterosexuality plays the structural role throughout the series that will become more significant in later books. (laughs) Like starting in the fourth book, things start to get like (laughs) real hetero. (laughs) And of course, you know, we can look at characters like Lockhart and later at, you know, Umbridge and Rita Skeeter and think about how those who fall outside the expectations of heteronormativity or who perform their genders in subversive ways are usually coded as villainous and untrustworthy in this Mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. And then we could also, you know, expand our lens even further and look at things like the heteronormativity of the mainstream fandom and like the shipping wars, right? Who is it considered acceptable to ship and who is it not? You know, how is heteronormativity reinforced in terms of how people treat these books? You know, those kinds of things. But there's actually this one particular insight that comes from queer theory that I think about all the time. And this is an insight that comes from Rachel O'Connell, who is a queer studies scholar at the University of Sussex. And this comes from my favorite kind of scholarly text, which is an email she sent me one time. (laughs) I love it. Amazing. So O'Connell has specifically pointed out how Harry, as a protagonist, acts as this kind of cipher for a specifically queer desire. And this was kind of her attempt to theorize why Harry's such a bland protagonist. She's Hmm. like, the whole point is that Harry's supposed to be sort of like this everyman, as we talked about in the very first episode, but you are able to read yourself into his position and that you then share with him what she identifies as a queer desire, which is the desire for somewhere else, specifically as an alternative to the world of the Dursleys, which is quintessentially heteronormative, especially as heteronormativity aligns with a kind of white middle class respectability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in that sense, Harry has this queerness from the get go in the sense that he is not acting right. Like he doesn't fit into the heterosexual family unit. He doesn't look the way he's supposed to. He doesn't act the way he's supposed to. He is a kind of queer child figure in the sense of subverting heteronormativity, even if not in the sense of like, you know, goes out and does gay things. <laughs> and this is, this is, I really want to flag this. Like when we are talking about queering things, we are talking about resistance to structural heteronormativity. Okay. Right. That's what it like means to queer something. In order to queer something, the characters themselves need not be queer. It's that their relationship to the world around them is queer. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, the characters themselves don't necessarily need to be gay. Right. I'll get to this in a moment because I think we can articulate a difference between like sexuality and queerness, Mm -hmm. which is also important. So O'Connell compares 
Harry's experience of escape to Hogwarts to the experience that a lot of queer people have of going off to university for the first time and finding a space where we can safely explore our queerness outside of our childhood homes or the expectations of our families. And she also has this really interesting link to a book by D.A. Miller called Place for Us, Essays on the Broadway Musical, this idea of there being a place for us, uh, which explores... Just hold my hand and I'll take you there. Exactly. That book is all about how musical theater has become so central to gay male subcultures. But this idea of, of an elsewhere that you need to get to in order to actually be able to be yourself has a queerness to it. So this reading goes a long way to accounting for why there's such a strong queer fandom, despite the actual absence of any textual queerness and despite Rowling's transphobia, that there is still for a lot of queer readers this sense of like the longing to be taken away from the restrictively heteronormative world into a world where there are extravagant variations from the norm has a queerness to it. Mm -hmm. So what I want to note here, as many queer theorists have, is that desire, this kind of, you know, queer desire for an elsewhere, for example, is not always sexual, mm -hmm. like explicitly about, you know, a desire for a sex act. We can instead read it as erotic. Hmm. So this is the last new idea I'm going to introduce. So Ella Shaibaiwo, who has written an absolutely gorgeous book called Asexual Erotics, which I love very deeply, defines sexuality as follows, quote, as a system for categorizing desire that arose as part and parcel of capitalism, modernity, and colonialism. As such, she continues, sexuality is a technique of biopower, square brackets, biopower is Foucault, and square brackets, <laughs> that invents normalcy and deviancy toward forwarding the interests of colonialism, whiteness, wealth, ability, and normality at the expense of sexuality's others, including its colonized subjects, people of color, poor people, disabled people, and those understood as sexually deviant, end quote. Right? So the whole idea of like stable categories of sexuality is deeply tied into capitalism, modernity, and colonialism. Of course, because you need to reproduce the state. Yes. Two thumbs way up <laughs> for that understanding, but not for that actual system. Two thumbs way down <laughs> for that system. Touche, touche, touche. Yeah. Great, great. <laughs> so, Shai Bai Wo has this great use in asexual erotics of an Audre Lorde essay called Uses mm -hmm. of the Erotic, the Erotic is Power. And basically says, you know, if we decenter the white dudes who invented sexuality like Freud and instead we center the theory and ideas of black lesbian theorists like Audre Lorde, then we can center the erotic rather than the sexual. Mm. And the difference is that the erotic is a way of thinking and talking about intimacy that is not necessarily tied to sex, but includes, again, in Shabaiwo's words, a myriad of other activities and relationships to the self and to others, hmm. end quote. So we can think about the many, many complex ways in which we are intimate with one another and intimate with ourselves that is not necessarily fixated on particular stigmatized sex acts. Mm -hmm. And that opens up this possibility to think about queerness without necessarily always moving to an assumption about, I mean, one, the genitals people have and two, what they're doing with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It's a totally different way of just like reimagining of the world with queer erotics at its heart that just throws heteronormativity into the garbage <laughs> bin of history, <laughs> which is where it belongs. Yeah. yeah, that was a bad experiment. It didn't work out for most people. So let's not do that anymore. Just right out, right out into the garbage can. Mm -hmm. And instead, 
we can revisit our whole imagining of the world and thus our way of reading the texts that are part of that world or that help us understand that world better with this kind of enthusiastic exploration of queer possibilities, which is like what a lot of the fandom does anyway. Yeah. You know, Hannah, when you describe it like that, it sounds almost like queerness is natural. I mean, it's just the whole phrase natural, like the idea of naturalness means nothing. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like the whole desire for things to be natural is a desire for some things to be aberrant. Right? We don't need the idea of natural if we don't have unnatural. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And so if we throw out the whole... The whole idea of nature. <laughs> suck it. Suck it, trees. <laughs> then we have, you know, new ways of exploring possible relationships and possible ways of being in the world. You know what? I like that. I like the idea of possible instead of natural, mm-hmm. right? Like what is it like yeah. what is a possible way to be in the world as opposed to what is a natural way to be in the world? I like that. You love the idea of possibility. It's your favorite. I really do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what I'd really like us to do now is return to the text. And look at some of the places where Harry's longing for and love for Hogwarts might shed some light on potential queer readings of the book. All right. Well, before things get to merry and gay in here, we have to keep our heads on straight to take our owls. Thank goodness we're using queer theory to unpack something new about Harry Potter. Am I right? I love how many old Christmas carols use gay to mean happy, but but then become in my personal relationship to them extremely queer. <laughs> anyway, let's all strive to make the holiday season as gay as possible. Yes. Yes. And also to make Harry Potter as gay as possible. So let's do that now. I love it. So there's a few different places where we can really see this longing at work in this text. So, you know, we start right at the beginning of the book with these images of Harry as like trapped and explicitly longing to get back Mm -hmm. to Hogwarts. You know, the idea of the heteronormative household as a prison is literalized in this opening. He is literally caged in you know, the heterosexual family home. And then as soon as he gets back into the wizarding world, we get this image of the burrow, the first place he goes, which what makes him love the burrow so much is that it is, quote, bursting with the strange and unexpected. Sounds pretty queer. (laughs) It sounds pretty (laughs) queer, right? That like, in the sense that like, It is that which varies from the oppressive norms. You know, it's still a very heterosexual household. We're talking about a sort of resistant queer reading here to a text that itself is pretty structurally straight. Like the Weasleys had six boys and then eventually had a girl and they just kept having children until they could have representation from the only two genders that exist in this universe. A hundred percent, right? That whole idea of like, I'm just going to keep having children until I have one that has, like, is assigned to the biological sex that I prefer. Like, it's just a, just like a deeply (laughs) heteronormative thing to do. But what really interests me if when we take up O'Connell's reading of this queer desire for the elsewhere is how it frames Harry's relationship to Voldemort because Harry encounters Voldemort in this book not as a scary Mm -hmm. monster but as a kind of doppelganger figure because Tom Riddle looks Mm -hmm. like Harry right he's also like skinny boy with black hair And even more importantly, he shares Harry's relationship to Hogwarts. So this sense of like his life and his world outside of Hogwarts is bad and oppressive and he longs to be only at Hogwarts all the time. And so they have this sort of parallelism in this book, right? There are these very similar characters and that plays through in Harry's constant anxiety 
that maybe there's something dangerous inside of him, some truth about who he actually is that he can't let get out because if people knew it, they would, you know, judge him and reject him. And that thing in him that he is terrified might be true is a thing that is true of Tom Riddle. Tom Riddle, who shares Harry's desire and longing for this elsewhere. And that comes to a head in this moment where they confront each other face to face. And Tom Riddle says, I've waited a long time for this Harry Potter for the chance to see you, to speak to you. And then it describes Tom Riddle's eyes roving over the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with his expression growing hungrier. Sexy. (laughs) I'm just saying that this encounter with one's doppelganger as framed through this kind of queer longing and dangerous buried secrets, it's just all real gay. It's pretty gay. (laughs) I think is my like critical, my critical reading of that relationship. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm into it. It really stood out to me in this reading how when we start to think about a longing for elsewhere, a longing for Hogwarts as an elsewhere, as a sort of queer longing, then that particular queer longing is a thing that unites Harry and Voldemort from the beginning. And that when we look at these two characters as outcasts who are united by a shared queer longing, that really destabilizes a lot of the structural heteronormativity of the books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. There are certain ways in which it feels almost like the trajectory of the story is designed to prevent that kind of queering Mm. because if we go back to your earlier point about the coming of age story being like a necessarily heterosexual story type the person who harry is rescuing is Ginny, and at this point in time that's just a coincidence but over the course of the stories this is the person who he ends up falling in love with and then eventually marrying and so like It's interesting to me the way that, like, the text knows that it has this incredible capacity or these possibilities and in these very unnecessary ways tries to preempt the queering by, like, well, no, (laughs) he's rescuing his wife and his wife looks like his mother. (laughs) Yes, yes, right? Like that's a deeply heteronormative Mm -hmm. structure. And we can tell, you know, in a way that is not dissimilar to how Judith Butler points to like, oh, you got to work so hard to uphold a binary that these texts are working so hard to uphold their heteronormativity because one of the most popular ships is Harry and Draco. Mm. Like, It's popular for a reason. Tell me, what's the reason? Because it is picking (laughs) up on something inherently queer about this text. And particularly the way that Harry's queerness is often articulated via his relationship to Slytherins, to snakes, to the dark forbidden secrets of the wizarding world, to the more dangerous sides of it, you know, that those are all things that we see at play in this book, you know, in that confrontation with Tom Riddle, but that get played through, you know, particularly via his obsession with Draco, which (laughs) which becomes more powerful as the text progresses. But, you know, the queer foundation of that obsession is being laid in this text. My goodness. But that is not the only place that we can read (laughs) queerness in this text. It's not. There is another example that I really want to talk about. Before I start talking about it, I just want to say that I have been in a number of classroom settings before where people have attempted to draw comparisons between queer sexualities and sexualities that we might consider to be abusive. And that's like a long-standing 
tool of heteronormativity to delegitimize queer sexualities. And I want to be very clear that I am not doing that here. Can I give an example of this just briefly before you give us this reading? Relatively recently, Sophie Lewis, who is, amongst other things, a queer theorist, wrote this amazing Twitter thread about the Netflix documentary My Octopus Teacher. And the Twitter thread basically says that the relationship that we see between the octopus and the scientist in My Octopus Teacher is both a queer and an erotic relationship. And that the octopus is teaching this male scientist about queer erotics. And it's a beautiful thread. It was posted on September 20th, if people want to find it. It's a really beautiful thread about queer erotics and octopi as sort of boundary-threatening figures. And a ton of people responded to this and were like, are you saying he had sex with the octopus? And all of, like, all of these queer theorists on Twitter were like, you don't know what erotics mean, do you? But this desire to jump from I'm exploring the exciting queer potential in this unusual relationship to jump from that to a kind of stigmatizing of queer sexuality. I mean, it's a fundamentally homophobic move, but the reading you are about to offer has like strong <laughs> roots in queer theory. <laughs> so the relationship that I want to talk about is Argus Filch and his cat, Mrs. Norris. I think that the text tries to make Filch's love for Mrs. Norris, quote unquote, unnatural or creepy or aberrant. And I've decided to refuse that reading <laughs> and instead to think about it as actually a really touching example of queer love or queer companionship. So I talked about this in our wrap up episode for book one, which was episode six. But irrespective of that, I want to suggest that we read Filch and Mrs. Norris's relationship as queer love because of the ample textual evidence that they are partners in their relationship. Not subject object, not owner and pet, not master and beast, but in fact, a team, partners. And the assumption that loving companionship is necessarily sexual is one of the trappings of compulsory heterosexuality and heteronormativity. So I think reading Filch and Mrs. Norris's relationship as queer allows us to break out of the ideology that the only legitimate forms of companionship are reproductive. And I mean, just think about the absolute devastation that he experiences when he discovers that Mrs. Norris has been attacked. Like he is, he becomes unhinged because this is his life companion. And I think it's really heartbreaking. And I think that his love for her is probably the single most humane thing about Filch in his entire characterization throughout the series. I mean, I think we can look at in general in the series a sort of queerness to people who have really foundational relationships to non-human others. You know, Hagrid is a character that we have talked about as legible as a queer character and that I know on Friend of the Podcast, The Gaily Prophet, they have talked about reading Hagrid as a trans woman. And I think that while it is less stigmatized in Hagrid because he's a quote-unquote good character and Filch is a quote-unquote bad character, that there is a similar sense of sort of relationships that are in excess of the norm, that subvert the norm. And that while because Filch is treated so badly in a way that I actually think is ableist, which I am interested in us returning to in a future episode because him being a squib is tied really closely in this book to him being villainous. You know, I think we see also in Hagrid that he is this kind of queer character because his almost maternal love for the animals that he cares for and his sympathy and love for things that are usually rejected as monstrous also has a sort of queer excess and queer subversion to it. 
right? Look at, for example, the way that he has this intimate familial relationship to a monstrous family of giant spiders for whom Hagrid is part of their family unit, right? And is there anything queerer than chosen family? Truly nothing. And it is beautiful. Truly nothing. Except for the fact that they're giant spiders. <laughs> I just... It's... Yeah, and they, you know, the book very quickly takes this queer possibility and shuts it down by turning those spiders back into monsters, which is really interesting because the thing that makes Hagrid this subversive figure is right from the get-go tied into the fact that, like, he loves monsters. And that's how Tom Riddle is able to scapegoat him early on, that Hagrid loves monsters too much, right? That he loves the wrong things in the wrong ways. And that is why he is cast out of Hogwarts. And it would be, I think, much more interesting to let those monsters remain at least sort of ambivalent or liminal figures. But instead, this text, which is working so hard always to take these sort of queer possibilities and then like clamp down on them, has to be like, Hagrid loves these spiders. Isn't that great? Anyway, the spiders are monsters and try to eat our hero. (laughs) Maybe to conclude this segment, I want to point to how, you know, as we are trying to unpack the queer resonances of this book that we immediately have to start going into Mm -hmm. animal studies. We have to start thinking about, you know, the legibility or illegibility of gender. We have to think about how we set up boundaries around the human and the non-human, which as we know, also has a lot to do with how we set boundaries around the colonized and the racialized. And so, To go back to that sense that queer theory is foundationally and fundamentally intersectional, we can see, right, in starting to try to actually use it, to read the text through it, that it immediately leads us in all these directions that are themselves innately intersectional because they're drawing back on all of these other threads that we've already brought up. So, you know, in conclusion, there's a lot more interesting queer things happening in this book, I think, than the fact that our bad guy uses curlers and wears pink sometimes. But as we wrap that sort of queer coding of Lockhart as a villain back into the rest of these readings, we're reminded again of the way that the text seems to be constantly opening out these possibilities for queerness and then like clamping down on them. You know, these like cool, interesting, subversive possibilities keep creeping in. And it's so much fucking work to constantly stamp them out. I really struggle to wrap my head around it because it isn't an accident that the text is drawing on queer desire to represent Harry's alienation in the muggle world. Even the way that like the Dursleys use language like we said we would stamp that nonsense out of him. And the text tells us that they've tried to crush his magic and like using all of this language that's very much part of the vocabulary of describing straight parents trying to force their queer children to be straight. So all of that is really obviously intentional. And yet at the same time, the text refuses to allow a kind of capacious queerness. It has to be a heteronormative queerness. It has to be queerness in a very like limited and specific and allowed kind of way in the same way that like, oh, did you know Dumbledore was gay the whole time? Ho ho. That's the difference for me between a sort of liberal ideology of tolerance Mm -hmm. Right? This idea of like, I'm a good liberal minded person. And so I have room for everyone. And yeah, there's a gay character in this book. You just couldn't tell because gay people look just like the rest of us, which is a wildly heterosexual (laughs) thing to say. Which isn't to say that you can guess people's sexuality by looking at them, but is this re normatizing of homosexuality into the status quo of the heteronormative. And we see this all the time in sort of mainstream narratives that try to make homosexual relationships legible in a way that will be comfortable within heteronormativity. 
without actually being dangerous or subversive in any way. And so we can distinguish between a comfort that we might see in a book series like this with being like, no, of course, absolutely. I believe that gay marriage should be legal and a discomfort with the actual subversive destabilizing possibilities of queerness. Yeah, exactly. So those are just not the same thing. Thank you, witches, for joining us for episode eight of Witch, Please. You can find the rest of our episodes by heading over to notsorryproductions.com or ohwitchplease.ca or, of course, wherever podcasts are found. Witch, Please is produced in partnership with Not Sorry Productions and distributed by Acast. Special thanks to our endlessly patient producer. Greetings. And to Not Sorry Productions for having us. And thanks to you, witches, for coming with us on this new journey. If you're into the reboot, why don't you let us know by dropping a review on Apple Podcasts. Every week, we'll read five-star reviews here, so you've got to review us if you want to hear me mispronounce your name. For example, thank you for the reviews. Lucy F- which I think is probably just Lucy FHW, but f- what? Kristen Prosen, Tammy R622, Jen Zuko, Drew Ski Lol Happy Face Emoticon, <laughs> Eleven Ladybug Eleven, and Doctor Reverend Avazian. A a Avazian. Avazian. Mm, there were some real doozies this week. Mm, Hannah loves this. Also, don't forget to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ohwitchplease. We just recorded a bonus Q&A segment where we explain why we think Miss Andre is funny. <laughs> so you definitely want to hear that, <laughs> but you need to support us to get that sweet bonus content. On our next episode, we'll be continuing on our journey through Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets with a whole different focus. But until then... Later, witches. 